I'd like to welcome all of you here this evening. And uh, tonight we have with us, as our guest, a uh, furniture designer and builder, a craftsman. He uh, is from Boston and uh, received his training at uh, Boston University and uh, two years with the Master Craftsman. He has received several awards, uh, Progressive uh, Architecture Magazine in 86 and uh, ID Magazine in 87. And uh, I think we're in for a real treat tonight. And uh, let's welcome, if we will, Mr. Tom Hucker. Good evening. I have two carousels that I want to show tonight. So there's, in a sense, two shows. One will be, the first will be of my own work. And I'm going to start right from the beginning in high school. So bear with me. Um, and I'll try to explain why I do that. And the second carousel will be of a variety of people working in this country and what I like to term the studio furniture movement. These are people who find their design and find their product in the studio and they're trying to find a bridge between architecture, between industrial design. It's kind of a loophole. If you listen to a uh, contemporary music, there's also a movement of the underground where people are doing their own tapes. And they're doing this in part because they know they're not going to have a wide enough audience to be able to go through all the production of a real slick, edited thing where you have to sell millions in order to break even. But you can do mail order and get, say, 20 cassettes. And I think there's a similarity. So if you have any questions at any time, please ask, because it'll. I have no notes. Every time I do this, I get up and just try and feel out with the audience. So the more you ask of me, the more I'll understand what, you, what you're interested in. OK? I have it. Let's go. OK, watercolor. Back in high school. The reason I start with this watercolor is not because I think it's a great watercolor. It's because I think the piece had a, a feeling to it. It had a clarity of emotion. And the reason I start with this is because that's the key to anything, whether it's furniture, whether it's architecture, whether it's painting, is if you can get a feeling. The technology, the craft, all of it is secondary to the feeling that comes out of the piece. You can disagree. Oil painting, kind of a crazy guy in high school. But there became, as I got near the end of this, this is a large charcoal drawing. It's about seven feet long. Um, I felt very insecure about the fine arts. I remember one time I was going to a show, and the painting rubbed against the ceiling of the car, and some of the paint wore off on the traveling. And when I got there to exhibit it, I didn't know if it was better or worse. What are your parameters? Every, you're just so far out on your own that I personally had a very difficult time dealing with it. I really didn't know. I was like, gee, this is great. Gee, this is terrible. And I got very involved in wanting to have something that had uh, certain concrete parameters to it, such as furniture. It's comfortable. It's not comfortable. There's certain things it has to do. And the other thing that I became very interested in was learning a material. And the best way I think I can talk about that is my grandmother was a uh, concert pianist, so I grew up listening to great music. And there's a craft to being able to play the piano. And knowing that craft, you start a relationship between what you can do and what you're thinking about. The doing involves in the composition, and it works back and forth. And I think when we, one way to talk about craft as a knowledge is that once you get very involved in it, what you're learning changes what you think about. What you think about changes what you want to try and be able to do. And I like that relationship. So the first things going into the shop, we're still working on a sculptural basis. Raw burl, but working with these kind of Chinese joints on the hoop. Some of these slides are horrible, but as you know, we're also looking at high school slides. Just kind of playing some games. All right, let's see if we get a little better here. And then moving more into furniture. Um, I have no undergraduate degree. I was accepted to a few art universities, but 
really wanted to move into furniture rather quickly. So what I did is um, went to the American Crafts Council in New York and pulled the files on uh, 50 craftsmen in the country that I respected, wrote all of them letters. I got five letters back and all of them said, forget it. Um, however, one gentleman, Sam Maloof, who is, uh, you may know because he's in the Los Angeles area, said, I do teach a three-week class in North Carolina, come on down. And as soon as you hit the material, you, the first thing you want to do is take this kind of hard clank and see if you can get form. The first technical challenge is, can I get form with this? At least it was to me. And this is just very basic stuff of learning how to try and develop form with this material. Just a little wall cabinet. Wendell Castle was doing his stack of laminated stuff. We're looking at early 60s now. Um, and in my various travels of looking for a teacher, I finally found a fifth generation German cabinet maker in Germantown, Pennsylvania. And all his work was veneer, all his work was built in. Didn't really like the work, but there was a mystique about this man. And I didn't quite understand it, and I used to drive down and beg him to teach me. And he'd say, oh, come on down, come on down, no problem. And I'd get there and he'd be gone. So then I stopped calling, I'd just show up. And I'd catch him working. And it just bothered him. So finally he said, all right, this is what we're going to do. I charge 25 bucks an hour to do a commission. You come to me on Sunday and you pay me 25 bucks an hour. And instead of a commission, I'll teach. And after two and a half hours, go home to your own studio, leave me alone. And we did that for two years. And this was the first piece I brought him. And I had worked so hard on this. And I was so proud of this thing. And he just looked at it. He went, I don't even want to talk about this thing. Just make me a simple box. And I brought this to him. And I thought, well, I'm just going to make him happy. You know, this is for him. It's not important. He criticized this for two hours. He said, you got lazy over on this corner sanding. You took two passes with 220 over here instead of one. Your screw heads don't line up. I said, so what? I'm just putting hinges in. And he said, why don't you leave your fly down when you walk down the street, too? It matters. And all of a sudden, I started figuring out what this guy was all about. And it was a fabulous thing. And the guy was eccentric, but not eccentric. In other words, once you get to know him, you understand why he does what he does. But in a sense, it doesn't fit in the world anymore. Um, it gets kind of crazy. The guy was literally born in a wood shop. His father was working. His mother was pregnant. She came to the shop to give her his father lunch and went into labor. So they moved her into the sawdust, and Leonard came out. <laughs> I mean, this guy was cutting dovetails at five, you know? But one day I asked Leonard to give me a real challenge, thinking that you know, it was a test. You, know, you can't really do this. And he pulled out um, drawings he had of traditional Ming Dynasty joinery, these interlocking joints that come in on the side and up from the bottom. He cut one in half an hour and gave it to me and said, go home, practice. And I came back the next day with a grocery bag full of like splinters. But then there became things where I wanted to work on that. So this is a piece that represents, these are the Chinese joints up over on the outside edges. But I was at the same time very caught up in what was going on in kind of what we might call my world or the 70s being a young guy wanting to be hip, looking at Wendell. So these pieces are in a sense are very much about that conflict. They're pieces that are using book-matched veneer. They're pieces that are using Chinese joinery where t it takes a huge amount of skill to put them together, but in a sense, they're very quiet. You don't notice them. And then going into the sculptural things in the center. So these pieces, to me, I understand what they're about. I'm just trying to explain why these things are. They're trying to resolve this guy who feels caught between two cultures. Question? Castle. Veneer, you know, when I started out, I thought veneer was bad stuff. And this guy would, he opened a book one day of like historic furniture. He just went, you like this? I said, yeah, that's great. You like this? We went through like 200 photographs. And he goes, each one of these has veneer. He said, in the old days, you'd find a nice piece of wood. My grandfather 
would hand cut veneer. It's not like we're trying to get some cheap stuff and put it on here. They go way out of their way to get the stuff. And the great pieces use it because they're trying to use the great woods. He said, apprentices work in solid wood. Journeymen work with veneer and masters do marquetry. And that's the hierarchy. Corner cabinet, again, um, working more the, the Leonard, the traditional veneer work on the interior and then doing more of the sculptural work, solid wood work on the outside and getting this relationship, trying to balance the relationship where each slat of solid has a corresponding two-dimensional representation in the uh, sapwood. Colors way off on this. It's Indian rosewood, so it's a jet black, blue black wood on the outside. Like that, like that seamless paper. Um, small rocker. Uh, came out to Los Angeles and spent a month working with Sam Maloof. Uh, not too much to say. Again, there's a lot of organics, but again, still trying to work on the comfort. Technical challenges, but drawing, going back and forth. This piece I, I look at and I think of immaturity in designing. But I understand the problem. If you look at this piece, and as architecture students, it shouldn't be any problem. If you look at the elevation from the top, you see one piece. You look at it from the, from the front, and it seems like it's another piece, and you get the side. In other words, that kind of being able to turn the piece in your mind so that the, the drawing is really, it's like sheet music. It's just noting the idea that you can see, or if it's musing, it's just notation the sound you hear. But at this piece represents a guy who's still designing, looking at the paper. And then when you put it in three dimension, it has problems. So when I look at this piece as a piece in my past, this is a guy who didn't get his three dimensional visualization down yet. <laughs> OK. We've jumped a little bit. Um, after two years with Leonard, it's very important what happened, in a sense, to me, because the main thing to Leonard was, I'm going to train you to be good enough to make a living. That's the point. I'm not a craftsman, a traditional craftsman, because I'm here to dazzle people. I don't want to show in galleries. I don't want a reputation. I want to be left alone. I want to get good work, do it. And he had a caboose in the country, like a train caboose that he stuck in the mountains. And he wanted to go up there on the weekend and feed squirrels. And he couldn't understand all this gallery stuff and these guys. He said, you know what American craftsman is? He's a guy who makes a piece for you, opens up his wallet, and gives you $200. It's crazy. But I was still caught up in the, in this, the art background, the studio. I wanted more. I wanted the stuff to make the statement. And we reached a point where he got very angry at the way that I was still drawn towards that. He said, you're good enough now to go out and make a living, and you, you're not satisfied with that. Don't come to my studio anymore. Right at that time, a new program opened in Boston, Boston University Program in Artisanry, which had an, an advanced degree or an advanced training based on portfolio, because at this point, I'd had two years with Leonard, but if I wanted to go back to wood school, I'd have to start as a freshman and learn dovetails, which I wasn't about to do. So I went up there, and they allowed me to come in and jump right into work with this. And as you'll see in the second carousel, they had some amazing people teaching. And there was one man in particular, Jerry Osgood, who had a fabulous way of, through a technique of lamination, of getting very nice forms. So it was like three years of studying with Jerry, using his techniques, his vocabulary of structure and uh, manipulation of material. Now, the funny thing about this one is I wanted an elegant piece. And we have everything but that. It looks like a chest of drawers that eats Volkswagens for lunch. But it's also about an ego of like, I want to do the most convoluted thing possible. So here we have the beast.
But there were other things that were kind of fun. I mean, where do you draw the lines? There was a, a kind of a competitive school with us with a traditional English master. And he came to the opening of this. And he goes, uh, <clears throat> this piece is a failure because if you put a wine glass on the top, it'll fall over. And my teacher came up and said, no, that's incorrect. If you put a wine glass on it, it'll just slide to the center. Yeah, happy chair. Uh, the problem was make something as light as possible, make the engineering and the structuring as important. No element can go on the piece that is not also physically necessary, structural as well as visual. And I love that project. It's been a major influence ever since. It's just a small side chair. But it seems so cheery. Mold, you know, it's, uh, well, we won't get into technical talk, but it's kind of fun in terms of the three-dimensionality of that seat, how the bend and then the coop ring, you can, you can develop these three-dimensional forms, because wood won't stretch. So if you want a three-dimensional form, you have to deal with it like paper. You have to be able to, you can bend one way and then build those seams up, but you have to cut. You can't just bend it like plastic, which can be real frustrating. Uh, so we're at Boston University, we're looking at 76 now. And another thing that was very interesting at that time was along with going through the university, because of Leonard and the, and the Chinese joinery, I looked at China quite a bit. And still to this day, Ming furniture is, I think, my favorite furniture of all. I think it's the standard which I take everything off of. I think it's the most classic forms, the greatest materials, and the most sophisticated workmanship yet very quiet that's ever been done. But they, uh, there was a pottery teacher there who, in ceramics, many times you look at Japanese. So I took a course with him in Japanese aesthetics, and we found a Japanese tea master, believe it or not, in Boston. So for the three and a half years I was at the university, privately I was studying the Japanese tea ceremony, um, which I don't know if any of you have ever done, but it was uh, extremely important to me in terms of aesthetic education. Because there was a situation where, in this country, the appreciation of objects is not held as an art form. And to be able to go into a situation and kind of pretend you're in a culture where that's not true, where objects are an art form, in order to be art doesn't mean you have to stop it from functioning, but instead you celebrate its function, was so important and to be able to sit down and hold a 400-year-old Orbe bowl and drink tea from it. And then also be taught that we're drinking from this bowl because it's winter time. And the colors and the patterns on this are about the spring. So when you're sitting here having tea, you're reminded that things are going to get better. That feeling, just like the watercolor, that feeling. And this is in the bowl. It's about the bowl. It doesn't subtract from the bowl. And it also makes a great thing to drink tea out of. If you didn't have it, you're, you know, you'd make a mess on the floor. Remakes of the chair. We're out of school now. Taught in Tennessee for two years. This may focus a little better. Little changes. I do come back to things. There are things that um, irk you. You know, you finish a piece and they just kind of feel uncomfortable. And many times you come back just because it bothers you. It never ends, though. It's dangerous. Dining room table. Uh, um, taking the problem, structure became important to me, how you can play with that structure. and. With a private client, you can do things that, if you were worried about mass production, you really shouldn't do. But you can go to this one individual and say, do you usually set a centerpiece? She goes, always. So you go, great, how about if you don't anymore? What do you mean? How about if we take that area and integrate the structure as the centerpiece? So that we can, in a sense, celebrate. Because furniture sometimes, if you love the aesthetic, sometimes it's hard to always 
especially with the dining room table, put a four by eight sheet over all the information. So if you can <laughs> open that up and see it, go ahead. At the same time, if somebody just throws a sheet of glass on it, I feel it's too easy, because you're not really struggling with the problem. This little wall cabinet. Again, let's just see how much we can rack this stuff. But Leonard's still popping up. Vertical, ve vertical veneer through the drawers to try and bring the drawers back. Before, if it was out of solid wood, you'd have horizontal graining. It would be much harder as a visual unit to make it, bring it back to a unit. You don't want I don't want to see the separate drawers. I want that to be one volume. I show this just because this is the one piece I made for the tea. It was really kind of funny. Um, the tea master, the, the interior insert is a pre-war Zen insert. And he gave that to me one day and he said, uh, I want you to make something for me and I'm going to let you do whatever you want to do. But the wood has to be this color. The joints have to be cut in a clockwise rotation. It has to be exactly these proportions. It has to be hand planed and not sanded. But other than that, feel as free as a bird. This piece is kind of a historical reference piece. There's a Chinese scroll box in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which I absolutely adore. And what would happen is the scrolls, this has changed quite a bit, but the original larger center section is where the rolled scrolls would be, and then out on these wings would be where the weights would be. So you would roll the scrolls out, put the weights, lift the weights, turn the scroll, put the weights back down. But as a form, I just love this kind of odd box with these little wings on it. So this is kind of taking off from that. This is a jewelry box about 30 inches long. And here it is with a matching one in Sitka. Now, it's kind of hard to see, but the real trick on this was how to hinge that curved seam. You have to take your pivot point back in order to get that curve to work. Little book stand. Oh, upside down. Oh, well. Just take all the little latches and drop them down and we're at the same spot. The lamination, right near the end of school, the laminating thing became a cliche to me. I felt as if um, in order to justify the aesthetic power of the piece could almost be determined by the pound pressure of torque put on the presses in order to make the forms. Does that make sense? You know, in other words, if, if I bent it more, it has to be better because it was bent more. And it just became kind of silly. So I set up the problem not to do it. We're going to go to the serial structural images, the serial system, and see if you can feel as good about it. Um, this is 12 feet long. I still, I still have this. I can't sell this piece for album storage with seven, seven compartment. It's Japanese rice paper over plywood for the doors. And the thing that really bothers me is, uh, now that we're into CDs, I'm sure I'm stuck with this for the rest of my life. <laughs> but I was very happy with the way this piece turned out. And it was very funny, the response I got. My own teacher, this was the last major piece I did for graduating. Slides, obviously, are back at out of sync a little bit, but um, other people said that they thought it was way too harsh and unemotional and totally in the wrong direction and thought I had fallen off the end of the earth. I was pretty excited about it. This is, <laughs> this is kind, of like, uh, kind of like what I had with Leonard. Now this is kind of like Japan collides with uh, Boston. Commission a uh, conf small conference table for an office in DC, an architectural firm in DC. 
And the idea here, again, structure became very important, where this, I knew this table would be put up against the wall, so I knew that I could take the back edge of the table and put a great deal of strength there, that whole plane dovetailed in. And then the people sitting around it, I knew I could get very light. So it was that kind of juggling. I knew that this piece would not be pulled away so that I could take all the function away from the one side and just put the structure there. And then these uh, display cabinets go behind a desk that we'll see in a minute. <clears throat> it's hard to read from the slide, but on the top view of these, they're somewhat triangular. And we had an argument going between he being able to want to see his, you know, QPO dolls and stuff, and me thinking it's really kind of dumb, let's hide it. So coming into the door, these kind of half doors block the view from the side, being able to see the stuff. But from, he sits on the other side, he can see right into the cabinets. And this is the desk that those are behind. This is a variation of another desk done for a private home. Done, yes, was two years ago. One of the things that's kind of, I, I guess you guys think about it all the time, but like that large desk was eight foot by six foot, but it had to go to the top floor of a building in an elevator that only held two people. So everything had to unbolt and break down so you could get it up. Same thing with this. It's kind of a new thing to think about. Yeah, I mean, uh, the shapes of those pods, columns, and then taking that top view, and then there's a, the same shape as a little ebony inlay that runs down the sides, and the table is thinner at one end than the other, so that the proportions are done to try and increase the power of that. I don't like to, uh, personally don't like two-dimensional imagery as a rule, because I want to stay with the form and structure. It's not so much that it's wrong, but in this particular instant, the client demanded inlay because I'm paying for it, I want it. Um, so I wanted to make sure that the image related to the form, that related to the form of the piece, not that it was just an applied thing. Bench. I was able to get over to Japan twice, once for three weeks, the next time for six weeks, and uh, stayed with the people at the tea headquarters. The influence was very strong. I also was very fortunate. I was a fortunate and not fortunate. The first time I went over, I met Tatsuaki Kuroda, who was the national living treasure for wood and lacquer, was making furniture for the emperor. And we discussed an apprenticeship, and I went away and got a letter saying, all right, you can come work with me. Be the first American ever to work for this man. And the next time I, the day I arrived in uh, Kyoto was the day he died. <laughs> so I got to go to the funeral. <laughs> it's in a sense not funny, but there's a side note that is, because I went over not expecting anything like this to happen. So I had bright red ostrich skin cowboy boots. And I'm going to a very formal, wake, and there are 400 absolutely identical black patent leather loafers at the door, and one pair of bright red ostrich skin <laughs> cowboy boots. Uh, other materials are becoming, at this point, are still very important to me. This is a small coffee table with uh, Kentucky Burley limestone for the bases. And, uh, because you guys study structures, you should know what's wrong with this. This table wobbles like mad. Oh, you can't really see it, but there's a little piece of, there's a triangulation to that rear foot. 
they had to have triangulations in the slabs. This is a variation on this table, kind of change, trying to change the feel. This is out of a softwood out of Sitka spruce. This one with bronze. And then a later, later variation with the wenge and uh, changing the shape of the bronze somewhat. And this is, again, is maybe too much of trying to keep going back into a piece, but already these pieces are bothering me again because I've treated the bronze like wood. I've taken this very fluid modeling material and tried to make it look like a guy with a scribe line and sat there and hand planed the stuff. So now I want to go right back into the studio and try and play with the bronze quality. But the thing that's interesting there, gee, see, I just got out of the foundry on do these things, was it was real important to be in the foundry doing this. I have a f made friends with a sculptor who has his own foundry, so he said, you can come in here and do it, but I'm not going to do it. So I spent you know, a month ramming 400 pounds of sand and sitting there doing burnouts and all this kind of stuff and grinding like mad. But through doing that and through looking at his work and getting a feeling for that environment and watching the metal pour was critical to saying, oh, I'm doing this all wrong. And I think that's where the studio is important, critical. Because if I wasn't in the foundry, I may not have ever thought about what I was not being sympathetic to. I had to watch the metal pour and see it in the rough sand in order to realize that I was trying to treat it like wood, that my mind had closed. I'd been doing wood for so long that whatever else I touched, I was going to do the same way. But it also means I have to do it again. Uh, here's, a, here's my anti-Memphis piece. <laughs> it's, uh, this is just a sheet of raw silk. Oh, this backwards, but on this hinge to, for, the, for the shelves in back. It's a corner cabinet. It's kind of a funny poetic gesture to this. I, I thought, you know, everything's so loud right now, I want to do something really quiet. And it succeeded. It's been real quiet. Nobody's ever really noticed it. I mean, this has been in like four shows, and people like just walk by it. They just like, oh, there's a piece there? Oh, excuse me. This is an odd one. It's a low reception table. And yes, you will have problems with wine, you know, champagne flutes on this baby, but magazines make it. <laughs> but the issue was how do I get translucency in a top? without going with glass. How can I make a solid that you can see through? And this is the best answer I've gotten so far. If you have a better answer, please talk with me after the call. It's real hard to see, but there's the triangulated struts come up. The piece actually doesn't bounce around at all. I was amazed at how well it held itself together. There you can see some of the struts. Those struts continue all the way down on the inside, and then um, they're dovetailed on the top, so those lower struts, you get the triangle, and then you can support, you can cantilever those pieces out. And then the top pieces are lashed down. Oh, I do have a pointer. I will use it. Yay. So you're lashing the pieces down. But the thing that I didn't think about that I really fell in love with later was when this piece is on the floor and it's, it's lit from above, you get, the shadow, you, get the, you get the shadow lines coming down between each of those slats, too. So you have the black linen lashing and then you have bright light on that, and then you have shadows where the lashing isn't. And so there are all kinds of little things started happening, which was a lot of fun. This was a commission for a, a stereo freak. But the thing that's fun here was that this piece is a circle on the top and a square on the bottom. It's molded plywood. It's all molded plywood. It's one form for the side and the front. And there was a dinner. At dinner, we talked about computers and do craftsmen hate computers. I had to go to MIT and get a physicist to figure out the mold for this. You know, if I had a computer and knew the math, I could have saved some time and money. <laughs> yeah. These are six foot tall lamps. <laughs> Oh, 
lot of conversation. Oh, and this one's even worse. <laughs> this is Todd's favorite. This is a good example of drawing more before you start. The hilarious thing about this piece is I like the top, but I never knew what to do quite to get it up in the air. And the problem I set for myself was to do a tall table, like a hallway table. But tables, you've do, if you do enough tables, just in terms of aesthetics, you're dealing with reasonably low surfaces. And, they, and in a sense, can get pretty easy after a while. But what happens when you want to get a surface, but you want it way up in the air, where the structure is extremely important? So this one, I got involved with it. I wanted to throw these volumes against very linear pieces felt okay about that, but the structure to hold that thing up got way out of control. But just recently, I took this piece, cut the base off, and dropped it down to floor level, and not only did it sell, but they called me up and want like two more of them. I just wanted to unload it finally. Oop, we got two. Is there anybody up there? We got two slides. Just blow it off. Is that going to mess everything up? Sure, if you'd like me to. Um, just in general, uh, if you probably notice that the woods I work with are, are more involved with color and density than they are with grain. Uh, again, that's because I like to, I like the forms. Um, and I tend to have very linear elements. Almost all the woods I work with are uh, exotic hardwoods. Uh, if you pick them up, they're quite heavy. I can't get much rosewood, but if I could, I'd use it a lot. Um, this is curly maple, domestic, and uh, a Vermont black marble on the top. And then these are variations on that one. The marble was so heavy. There was about 800 pounds of marble on that table that we needed lots of structure to keep that thing from torquing. These are uh, hollow plywood with veneered form, so they're very light. And so I could cut down on my structure. But right at this point, I'm very interested in that large rectangle format with these outriggers. Are, uh, are you? F you asked about woods. Are you familiar with the difference between, say, a burl, burl veneer? Does that make sense of what that is? Um, side chairs. These were extremely important chairs to me. Um, the, the craft, the importance in the workmanship, the importance or success of the piece in the, in the sweat and toil, and trying to say it's not about that. It's about the design. The design is important, that it doesn't have to be painful in order to be good. <laughs> we wonder if that's still true, but this was the solution for my attempt at really trying to change directions again. True. So these are gray lacquer over plywood with a, uh, it's the, the wood underneath is called wenge, which we've seen a lot of tonight, which is this dark the very dark wood. And then we're into a piece that's snow wood, uh, aluminum. Halogen light source. This is about six foot tall. And I hope, no, this is the main slide. The light source is at the top, and it's a, it's a focused beam. And then there's like a uh, aperture focusing on each one of the plates. So each one of the plates picks up just a piece of the light as it goes down. And the other thing is it'll collapse and go into a UPS box. Oh, here we go. Good. This is under its own power. This is what the thing does. No, that's just the focus beam hitting the floor. It's like a projector. Now, it's changed a lot. This piece has changed quite a bit. The problem we had with this one is if you put all the lenses in to get an absolutely focused beam, so you close off all the air convection around the bulb. This is the one that became a toaster oven. Okay. I mean, we had a 100-watt halogen bulb in this thing with no airflow at all. Yeah, good idea. And uh, the person at the end of this next set of carousels, Todd White, a very good friend who was in my studio at the time, 
we had quite a bit of conversation. He has to take some credit on this image, so we'll make him stand up at the end. All right, and then the last two slides I have are pieces that are about to happen, so I wanted to go from the last piece into what should come soon. These are just nailed up on the board and shot, so bear with me, but this is a low soap of using. I found a place in uh, Vermont which can lathe turn marble, and I want to go up there and get some rocks, broken rocks, so that there'll be parts that won't be cut off. There'll be some texture on the inside of the circle and then polish on the outside, and I want to get some of those those tubes turned and then put this very thin with a different level to the feet sitting on those for the bench. So this is a piece that I hope to get on. And then this is a new uh, coffee table where I want to play on kind of a sheet volume. It'll be a very exotic burl veneer top. And then on these kind of straightforward bases, but I want when you're standing up, you feel like you've got a volume to this, but when you get down, you'll see that it's really a very thin sheet. So if you have any questions, this, this finishes the first carousel. Please. No, in fact, when I, was in, when I was doing my fine arts, all through high school, I skipped shop class every day. I hated it. Um, and the first piece I made in, I graduated from high school a semester early and then went back begging to go into the wood shop, which the principal thought was really absurd. And uh, when I first went in and started working in wood, I thought walnut was whatever you painted on pine that these different types of wood, it was what you went to the hardware store and bought. Cherry was in a can and walnut was in a can. Um, so it's as you go along, you pick these things up. Leonard was very important for the basics, the various kinds of woods and so forth. I can't see with the light, so if you have a question, it's better if you just call it out. Did you stop several years to buy wood yourself or I end up ordering a lot. I'd love to stock, but uh, Loft space rent being what it is in Boston, no way, you know. But air, there, is a, there is a difference between air dried stock and kiln dried order because uh, kiln drying is a steam and heat process and it will blend the colors. Where if you get air dried, which means you pretty much have to stock yourself for air dried, you get a much better color definition in air dried lumber. How do I start? What I'm trying to do is, um, there, there's, some people go by historical reference. In other words, if you want a table, they'll look at an empire piece that they like. And I try not to do that, although I don't think I can divorce myself from it. But I try and think of, a chair is to get you this certain height off the floor and hopefully comfortably, you know, that that's the premise. So that how you can do that, any way you can do that, structure that, is okay. And then after that structure is established, and if I know I'm gonna work in wood, then what wood can do influences the structure. And then once the structure is established, I go into the detailing of how it should be shaped. Uh, if I join something together, I feel I can, if I want to, I can make something out of that junction of that's interesting, or I can try and make it go away. So when I'm first sketching, I'm not doing, all my first sketches are just like little straight lines, just little 2B pencil markings of structure. And once I get just a little cartoon of structure down, I'll go to the drafting board, put that down, and then try and put curves on top of that. A lot of what I do, actually there is a system, I'm not saying it's a good system, but my system really, even in the slides, 
as you can see that initial drawing, like the dining room tables, like, oh, I can take the center, I can curve down here, bring out triangulation on each foot. And then within that, there'll be a, there'll be a curve or a shaping to that, because if I do it just hard structure, I feel it's, it's, it's too cold. So if I can take that and get that structure and then soften it, I can bring the warmth back into a little bit. So that's kind of what I've been doing for a long time. Very much so, because it, it can make a big difference. Although, you have to be careful not to let it be a crutch. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, let's say like the last table I showed. Well, that's true. I don't have any argument with that. Um, but there is, depends on your audience also. Um, if you're doing industrial design, the real key to good industrial design is very, very good thought very good design that can be done expediently. We're not here to be finicky, because we can't afford it. It's, it's not a good or bad. But then on the other side, if it's one client who's coming to you and says, um, I want the best thing you can do, then I don't feel it's wrong to say, OK, we're going to get some of the best materials. But if I'm going to do that piece and put it in production, then it, you know, it's a different thing. I think it'd be very different from, and I'll probably get, you guys know, probably already figured this out, but if we're gonna do uh, the National Gallery, as architecture paid National Gallery <coughs> in DC, it's a whole different problem than let's do you know, mass housing, low cost housing. It's just a different thing, it's a different problem. In other words, I like, we were talking at dinner about uh, Herman Miller's equa chair. I think it's an absolutely brilliant chair. I love it as much as a great handcrafted piece. But it's fundamentally a different piece. It's different problems. It's a different attitude. It doesn't make it better or worse. It's just fundamentally different. The East Wing of the National Gallery shouldn't be that concerned about cost efficiency. It's a national celebration. You can disagree with me, but that's my, that's my thoughts on that. But it isn't craft, or the studio isn't about just design. But ID isn't really just about design either. But don't fool yourself that it's not about cost points. I did a line of things for uh, dance, tabletop items, which I don't show in the slides. But if I put in one little detail that may take seven seconds to make per unit, an additional seven seconds, no way. Since that's a dollar more on the shelf, get rid of it. So it's just a whole different thing, where if I want to argue with a client on a $10,000 table about a detail that's going to take an, an extra day, it's absurd to worry about it. Can be. You know, I think 
ID is a whole different game because they have to worry about sales. I mean, there's, I mean, I think there's some pretty, yeah, it's a different thing. No, I think, I think probably everybody feels that once you have a parameter, once you have a grounding, then you can take off, where if you don't feel a grounding. I think fine arts work fine if you feel this, if you can say, this is what I believe in. But I had a hard time saying, this is my thing, if that makes any sense. You know, if I went to painting now, I think I'd go, I'm going to do landscape painting. That's it. And once I made that commitment, I could take it so maybe it doesn't look like a landscape, but I'd know where I was. So it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to make a chair. Then all of a sudden, well, how far can I push it? As soon as you kind of have that focus. But I just felt like I just completely lost my focus in the fine arts. Because when I graduated high school was when there was performance art. I remember reading in Art in America about the guy who uh, committed suicide starting by castration with a razor blade and had a friend photo document it. And that was his piece. It's like, I don't think I want to go into this line of work. <laughs> you, know. you know, it's like, excuse me, I signed up for the wrong band, you know? Yeah, like, it took a long time to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no way to redo that one. Any other questions? Okay. Second carousel. It's kind of hard to know exactly where to start, but I'm going to start with this gentleman, Wharton Eshrick who lived in Paoli, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure when he was born, but he was worked in the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s, died in the early 70s. In fact, I believe he died in 1970. The interesting thing about Wharton is he was trained at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and Painting and started out as an Impressionist painter. And then he started making frames for his paintings. And then he decided he'd make a studio to put his paintings in. And then he start, thought he'd make chairs to go in the studio. And, coat hooks to go on the wall, and pretty soon he hadn't been painting for about 30 years. But I think that's fundamentally important, that he came from being a painter. And even though he changed into architecture, changed into furniture, it was in reference to the fine arts. He was very good friends with Kahn. And both of them worked on this, on his studio. This is a museum now, so if you ever get out to uh, Valley Forge, you know, George Washington, check it out. Paoli, Pennsylvania, right near Valley Forge State Park. Very nice little kind of subtle curve things going on on the roof line. Staircase. There's one part in here. Huh? Let's get the pointer again, just for fun. This piece right here, it's a mastodon tusk. It was just the shape he wanted for the railing. Little model for a staircase. Music rack. But it's just, there's a, just, there, again, it's the feeling. There's a different feeling to this work. It's not more elegant than, you know, probably Eames was working at the same time. You know, it may not be as resolved as one might want, but there's a certain thing going on. There's, there's a painterly feeling to this, even though it's a piece of furniture. <laughs> I think this piece is kind of hilarious, because here we have cubist furniture. But in a sense, bravo, we have cubist furniture, you know. Sam Maloof. If you ever get a chance being in Los Angeles to meet this man, I recommend that he's one of the sweetest human beings I've ever met in my life. Um, trained as a graphic artist, and I'm not exactly sure why he moved into being a furniture maker. I think he just really wanted to work with his hands. Sam probably, I'm not going to say Sam's one of the great designers, one of the great artists, you know, but uh, I think he makes probably the nicest furniture as furniture that you can buy. It's just good old solid, well done work, and the guy works like a madman. Double music stand. Hutch with cradle. It's 
see if I can focus this in a little more. Oh boy, rocker. We were talking at dinner again. Sam, as I understand it, makes about two pieces a week, which in terms of studio craft is huge volume. In terms of industry, they probably make his entire lifetime output in a day, at, you know, at a good South Carolina plant. Wendell Castle. Uh, whether you like him, hate him, don't know anything about him, uh, there's no question that he's going down in the history books. I do not have slides of his most recent work, but this guy has been pushing it ever since he hit the scene in the late 50s, early 60s. And uh, every time you turn around, he's doing something else. Very, he was contemporary in a sense with Sam, but at the same time, they're almost a complete opposite. Sam's been refining the same pieces his entire life. And this guy is gonna go from, you know, well, you have to think, when these things hit in the early 60s, they just blew people away. Most people hated them, now they've become classics. Trained as a uh, sculptor, undergraduate in industrial design, masters in sculpture. Drove out and met Wharton Eschrick and came back to Kansas, is where he went to school, and uh, did his sculpture thesis in furniture. The thing I love about Wendell, and this is just completely personal, is he can do, in whatever mode he's working in, he can hit some of these very delicate, elegant pieces, and then at the same time have these kind of huge, kind of aggressive pieces. And he'll do it in veneer, he'll do it in stack. It's, it's like one of the things through all his various changes is that he seems to have these two distinct kind of sides. He went into his trumploid, what he likes to call his carving. Fool the eye. I really feel badly that I don't have later work for you. He's, he's going into some very, very bizarre stuff now. But this is a little bit, he went into his uh, Ruhlman thing for a while. But if we look back at that earlier, I remember listening to Wendell talk in the 70s where he said, uh, I hate four legs, it's too easy, I, sh you know, I like organic form, I hate exotic woods, and then six years later it's four legs and silver and ebony. And, but we looked at that earlier stack piece and then we come back to this piece and you can kind of see him resolving the same design issue in two different styles. With the silver inlay, and it's an excellent piece. Oop. I'm getting no response on forward. Try reverse. Great. Okay. Again, ebony, ivory inlay. What he's doing now is like these big kind of organic polychromed legs with little burl things. I'll send you pictures. But the point is he's completely transformed again. He's continually moving. This is Jerry Osgood. Um, my, my teacher at Boston University. Spent three years in architectural training and then went into furniture, into uh, craft school. Very simple pieces, but I think, that, I think they're very, there are things about them that are just very nicely done. I don't know if that really explains it well, but I mean, it's just a, a thick leather seat. Very direct, very easy, but those cuts that get those little vertical knot lines in it is such a nice touch. You know, it's, the, it's just these little subtleties that Jerry spends time on that I think make him important. And I think the guy goes through more energy to do a simple statement than anybody I've ever met in my life. These are all little thin laminations to get these curves and then Cooper to get this slight bow. Each drawer front has a slightly different radius to it. A little more extreme here. Writing desk. <laughs> Chest of chair. <laughs> J 
Judy McKee. Judy McKee is working in Boston and has received quite a bit of press uh, for kind of this kind of primitive feeling. She's very straightforward forms, but the imagery has gotten her quite a bit of recognition. Alphonse Mateo, who was also teaching up at Boston. Uh, Alphonse's work has kind of got its own curious spot. You know. If you'd like me to slow down or if you have questions while I'm doing this. These are his valets, uh, which he's been doing for quite a while now. But it's kind of this animated personification furniture, but uh, you know, heads where the tops are, arms where the jacket hangs. It's kind of every sculpture student needs one of these. Oh, let me see. Now, I asked everybody who I got slides from to send me an image, and this guy didn't, so this is what he gets in return. This is the work of Richard Scott Newman, I believe. Yeah. Uh, in terms of just craftsmanship, in terms of ability with hands, nobody in the country can get glue glue two wood together. You know, he was telling me, you know, decimal points to the 4,000s on, you know, humidity content. He weighs glue on a gram scale. <laughs> I can't believe it. Richard Scott Newman. If you can see, I have a close-up of, I believe I have a close-up of these legs, but these legs are awesome. We have a spiraling flute that changes. Okay, if you come down with seven, as you come down and tighten, your radius changes to still stay in seven of your interior circle. The outside edge also tapers in. Then he comes back in and glues little strips of ebony that also taper in proportion to the leg, that are radiused in proportion to the leg. I don't get it. And he goes, no, but he said it took me a year to figure out the jig, now it's no problem. <laughs> Unbelievable stuff. But he said, you know, a lot of people have knocked Richard on his design, the overall feeling. But I was talking to Richard one day and he said something that made me change my attitude about the guy completely. He said, um, doing, doing the classics is a great vehicle for me to do what I love to do. In other words, he's admitting to that, solving that problem is what's turning him on. And he said, by this format allows me to do what I really love. And then it was like, I got it, I understand. I have a hard enough time getting just two boards together. Okay, another guy with no picture. A guy who in many ways kind of runs with uh, Richard is John Dunnigan. But there's a, there's a difference here. John's an opera freak. Kind of shows somehow. Oh. Now, so far the people I've shown you, in a sense, could be kind of just put in the wood craft field, but I'm trying to break it up a little more than that, and the studio movement doesn't have to be just about wood. This is Elizabeth Browning Jackson, who's working in New York. Just, I just think she's a fabulous. Fabulous designer, fabulous person. This is a rug, a flat rug. She's really good. She's really good. Yeah, go, go, baby, go.
No, the chair is standing. The rug is not. <laughs> but she did one piece that she didn't set slides up. But I, well, I'm in Los Angeles, but in New York they have these like hot dog vendors with this aluminum, this kind of perforated aluminum waffle board thing. The only thing I've ever seen on is like ham hamburger truck. It's kind of weird. So she designed a table and went to this guy on the corner selling hot dogs and stuff and said, where'd, they, where'd you get your truck made? And she found this one company in the country who like makes those things and had them make her furniture. So she got all this like hot dog vendor metal all over. It was a brilliant idea. And the great thing about this woman is she's actually very conservative to meet and talk to. So you can go to her loft in Soho and you're sitting, I mean, this is her loft. I mean, you're sitting in this kind of stuff and you're talking like about yachts and Narragansett. This guy sent me a, a tiny little photograph like this. This is Leo Blackman, an industrial designer in New York City. He's focusing mostly on lighting. This is his Balagna chair. But he's also been doing these light fixtures. This is the main one that I was interested in. It has a little switch and it automatically opens. And as it opens, the light gets brighter. And as it starts to close, the light dims. I thought it was a nice thing. <laughs> this is the guy I share studio space with. This is Jay Stanger. And you may react as you will. There are a lot of people who wonder how the hell the two of us can share a studio. <laughs> this guy's selling work like mad. Oh. This, <laughs> I also did not get an image of the, from the last person I want to show tonight, uh, Todd White. But Todd, uh, shared studio space with me in Boston for a year. Todd grew up in Kentucky and knows thoroughbreds inside and out. And uh, it's a good way to represent Todd is with the only horse that still finished first sliding in mud on its side. Small box. The pulls, can you see how the pulls are working through the wall on the drawers would be closing? The thing that I really like about Todd's work is um, there's a lot of work that's been done in the last 10 years where the, where the imagery became very important and almost became kind of dependent on imagery. But when we look at Todd's work, as the gentleman asked me earlier about design, if you just take away the fancy materials, take away the fancy imagery, the structure on this still holds up really well. And that's what I think is really, really exciting about this stuff. Side chair. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when I saw the uh, plan views for this thing, and he said it was a chair, I didn't know where this guy was coming from. <laughs> Chest of drawers, which also shared. One of the things with slight, slight ego thing, but. Um, Progressive Architecture Magazine has stopped, but used to run the annual furniture competition. Both Todd and I entered, as did 2,000 other people in the country. And uh, one night the phone rang. Todd there, you've just won the award. And he felt really happy, and then he felt real sad, because, and then two minutes later the phone rang, and I also got the award. And it just felt, it's like, it was just a lot of fun that you hear these two guys in this studio and the world's going on and you kind of feel like a jerk most of the time. And then you get this major competition and there's um, New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and then two guys from Charlestown, Massachusetts. You know. 
but I think this is just an amazing piece. Do you see how this piece is working? It has casters underneath, so it can fit in a corner, and then you can pull it out and open it up against the wall, and then open the drawers. And I believe, oh, faux granite chairs from top with the aluminum back support. And that does it. Uh, any questions again, folks? OK, thanks very much. I want to thank all of you for coming this evening. and. Uh, uh, March 9th, Bella Lewitsky will be here. And uh, thanks again.